global forums show on healthcare technology called Health is Wealth. CXO is the world's largest C-level forum, and its Pakistan chapter actually involves some of the most budding C-level professionals um, you can find from very from a wide array of different high-performing companies, from MNCs to telcos to the blue chip companies, and even some budding startups. We have with us today uh, a very enterprising guest, uh, Mrs. Nadia Bukhari, who is a globally well-renowned pharmacist and has recently just started her own venture of sorts called Sia Wellness. So I'd like to welcome you to the show, Nadia. How do you do? Thank you, Bilal. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. So uh, we did mention that this is uh, technically my first episode um, out of my uh, hometown, Lahore. But that's, I think, the purpose or like the benefit of having a webinar is that you can have it remotely uh, anywhere you can. The, the main purpose is just to, you know, make yourself available on an online platform so people can hear about, you know, budding insights for, you know, whatever the topic of the webinar is supposed to be on. So that brings us actually to the topic, which is e-pharmacy on a global stage. Um, it is my understanding, having known you for quite some time, that you, you've been working in Pakistan for quite some time. And, you know, you've been working in the UK. You're an, I believe you're still an associate professor at UCL, if I'm not mistaken, I am right? indeed, yes. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting addition to the already interesting health tech space in Pakistan is, um, you know, people who've been settled abroad who uh, have that superior or like technical knowledge in their respective field and who have that, you know, enterprising quality about them that makes them stand out as budding entrepreneurs. So naturally, the first question I'd like to ask you is what exactly your background is, be it professional or academic, and what exactly motivates you to get into the field of healthcare? So background-wise, uh, Bilal, um, and like you said, yes, it's, you know, you're remotely doing this, and uh, uh, that's the power of technology, uh, I might add very quickly there. Um, and uh, uh, I think one of the premises of, of these webinars as well is also seeing how technology can... Um, uh, uh, can, can actually um, promote and uh, better healthcare across the globe. Uh, my background, as you said, uh, I, I am a pharmacist. Um, I've always uh, wanted to be a pharmacist ever since I was 16 years old. Um, I started working in a pharmacy as a, as a Saturday job, and that really was, uh, you know, sealed the deal for me. And I've been a pharmacist ever since. I've worked in both community practice. I've worked as a clinical pharmacist in one of London's largest teaching hospitals, Bart's in the London NHS Trust, uh, before I came into academia. And I've been in academia now for 20 years. And uh, as you said, I am an associate professor at uh, UCL, which is uh, one of the world's uh, renowned universities. So uh, I am very grateful uh, to all the opportunities that have come my way. Uh, God has been great. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I've always had this burning passion to give back to Pakistan. So even though I've been born and bred here in the UK, um, I think this is something I, I, I really you know, need to uh, acknowledge and be grateful to my father for um, that he really instilled this love uh, for uh, for Pakistan within us uh, as children uh, and as we were growing up, Pakistan was uh, our holiday uh, destination, um, and I, I d developed a great connection with Pakistan. So uh, about sort of seven years ago, um, I was uh, you know I had this sort of itching desire to give back to Pakistan within the the healthcare space within the pharmacy space um, and that's when I started coming uh, connecting with uh, uh, relevant universities that that teach pharmacy as a course so Hamdard uh, Punjab University Jinnah uh, University for Women um, and actually came and, and started giving lectures uh, you know off my own back to, uh, to to try and support the profession. 
and and then from there then um uh, uh you know i was the uh then headhunted to work for uh, one of uh, pakistan's telemedicine companies i'm sure you all heard of doctors neajivan so i worked as a consultant their chief pharmacist for a couple of years and you know w- which really gave me a great sort of insight even further insight into working uh, in pakistan um and then now i have started my own uh, venture seha health and wellness where we're looking at sort of one stop health and wellness solutions for the corporate market so it's been a journey um it's been a it's it's been a very um uh i have to say rewarding journey as well but it's had had its challenges along the way um but one i you know a journey that i would never change and uh, i'm i'm very grateful for sort of the the support i've had around me uh and it's been uh like i said it has been challenging working both in uk and pakistan because i'm be- between both countries i'm at ucl and then i've got my own thing as well going on in pakistan but uh, but you know it's been a rewarding one at that of the quite an elaborate journey and uh, yes i keep hearing this from um uh, different people of pakistani origin regardless of what profession they're in is that uh they do have this you know love for their own country and especially when they get older and more settled in life they feel that it's imperative for them to contribute back to their fellow pakistanis one way or the other um you know that being said the next question that i wanted to ask has to do with healthcare systems that you have seen yourself in the uk and how they can be compared to healthcare systems in pakistan so um before before i give you the floor officially my own observations have been that you know pakistan is largely a very out of pocket market especially when it comes to hospitalization but when i talk to people in the states you know sometimes that out of pocket expense given their socio economic uh, standing of course is way more justified than the typical you know healthcare insurance plans that they're on because say somebody who's affluent would actually be worse off in insurance and and vice versa so there isn't that much of you know uh um equity and equality in that sense but what exactly or how exactly does say the nhs or healthcare even in the private space in uk operate and what have you seen in pakistan that's good and what do you see uh that needs to be changed or improved so if if you look at the us model their healthcare system is is, is solely based on 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 the private sector and if we look at the uk model uh predominantly we've we you know people use the nhs and the U, the nhs is funded by the taxpayers money so uh, and and the whole premise of the nhs uh, even starting was free healthcare for all and and we still are very proud of that and we are still you know um uh, delivering uh, that same uh, level of healthcare and and service around around the uk but having said that there's also between the private sector and the government hospitals and even the the bhus that i i i visited the basic health units you know sometimes there aren't enough medicines there or there might not even be a doctor who's there around the clock for example so the i i see a huge disparity there and also you know a very um fragmented uh healthcare system within Pakistan as well and there's a lot of work that needs to be done and please don't get me wrong there there's a lot of good work that is happening in Pakistan and I see various health ministries who are who really are doing doing good work um but unfortunately sometimes it's just a drop in the ocean because the, because the need is so dire and the population uh, you know that we we've got such a a, a a a a big population in Pakistan as well that the needs are not being met um and that's where you know your ngos are coming in and uh, and aid is coming in from all sorts even if we if we just take the floods for example at the moment as well it's uh, there there is a huge cry right now and a huge need uh, to support when when it comes to healthcare so and if we then compare that to the uk then you look at the nhs and you look at the private you know there are hospitals within the nhs that will that that give excellent service and high quality healthcare which are which is equivalent to say your private medical as well 
So I, I don't really, I don't think it's really fair to compare what's happening in the UK to what's happening in Pakistan because Pakistan has its own challenges, um, and and these challenges are, are not just national; they're also regional as well, depending on which province you're in and which which government is in power as well. So there's there's a sort of politics in play as well. I I liked you know. Um... How candid you were with the last point when you said it wasn't really fair to compare the systems or the systems in Pakistan um, based on my observations by simply looking at data collected over the past even 20 years, you're seeing a huge shift from public healthcare spending to private healthcare spending. In fact, now the majority of healthcare spend in Pakistan is done in the private sector. And even yeah. if you want to, you know, talk about the public sector, there's um, a lot of different initiatives that the public sector has come up with that sort of um, are in direct competition with uh, some of the products that the private health tech se sector is coming out with. And uh, it, it brings me back to essentially um, a conference that I attended back in Islamabad in 2014. It was an endocrine, sorry, endocrinology conference. And I ended up meeting a doctor from the NHS who uh, was also a, a member of parliament for CRU, uh, which I believe is near Manchester. Yes. And um, I showed him, and this was the time, you know, when Sayeth Online Pharmacy had just started up and I showed him, you know, our, our packaging and that packaging had a bottle of thyroxine uh, sodium in it. And um, he really liked the, the product. And I asked him, you know, how viable would an online pharmacy be in a market like the UK? And he said that, you know, in Pakistan, such a product actually is there for the near of the hour because you have a country that's around 70% rural where people don't have access to basic healthcare services. In the UK, even if you go to, um, you could say, uh, a village per se, they have basic healthcare facilities from hospitals that offer all sorts of care to pharmacies that are open that you know have a wide range of medicines available. Uh, so I think that's what actually makes Pakistan a very interesting market for health tech is if you look at the facts <laughs> and figures, the market itself is so huge and there's so much room for everyone to operate in. Absolutely. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with you. But, you know, I'm just going to sort of hone in back on the point that I was saying about sort of comparing. And I think this is something that actually annoys me, if I if I may say, when people compare and say, you know, UK me kya ho rahe, UK me kya ho rahe, no, the exactly. US me, and then you Pakistan me kyun ho rahe. What we've got to understand is that the landscape is completely different in Pakistan. The challenges are absolutely different in Pakistan. Yes, we need to ensure that everyone has access to health, basic health care, because that is a basic human right. Absolutely, we should be doing that. But, you know, where we are in the UK, where we are in the US, we should, yeah, it's great to look at gold standards. Absolutely, we should be looking at gold standards, but we've also got to be really real and see what's happening on the ground and see what is possible in Pakistan um, because it's not just about, okay, I've got this idea, let's do it. There's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, a lot of politics that we have to also navigate in Pakistan. Yes, and all those points and even more, I guess. So uh, I have to now ask you about... Um, you received a uh, distinction um, as a pharmacist on the global stage, I believe. Um, and it certainly you know, made everyone in Pakistan proud of your achievements. Um, and from my own experience, I noticed that healthcare, especially pharmacy field, is a field that's slowly going to be dominated by women. I mean, my yes. own experience is that you, know, you go to even a lot of health tech companies, vast majority of pharmacists that are hired are female. What message would you like to send women in Pakistan aspiring to go in the same field? I mean, you've seen this with female stay-at-home doctors. What, yeah. what opportunities do you see for pharmacists in Pakistan? So, so just I'll absolutely answer that question, but uh, just to sort of share some facts and figures. So I, I'm also the global lead for gender equity for the International Pharmaceutical Federation. So we're actually looking at these sort of gender equity issues across the board. Um, I just wanted to share this fact with, with with us with our listeners today as well that seven over seventy percent of the global health workforce are women. So women are actually delivering the healthcare. 
Um, but what we're seeing in leadership positions, we're seeing about sort of 23 to 25% of leadership positions are only taken up by women. So, you know, we're seeing a huge disparity there that, you know, we're seeing the women deliver the health, but they're not uh, being empowered or mentored or nurtured to actually get into those leadership positions. Now, if we look at pharmacy as a sector, uh, by 2030, we've got these statistics from, from the International Pharmaceutical Federation, that over 73% of the global pharmaceutical workforce will be women. So Bilal, that's why you are actually seeing more, more women, because uh, pharmacy is a field where we see more women uh, come into. Uh, my message for women in pharmacy is to uh, find yourself a mentor. I think that's um, well, that's one of the things that I've uh, that that I really have to sort of acknowledge uh, for where I am today. Having the right mentor, having the right support uh, for my growth. Um, and, you know, finding a mentor, it doesn't have to be a female mentor. I've had male mentors as well as female mentors as well. And the other thing I'd like to say is no opportunity is too small. I've never said no to any opportunity when it comes to even speaking at webinars. I've spoken at, uh, you know, uh, small level webinars uh, from high, high, high level webinars. Um, so I've never said no to any opportunity because it's all about networking. It's about meeting people. It's about um, getting your name out there. But also um, from any opportunity comes, you know, it snowballs into other opportunities as well. And I think that's another sort of uh, reflection I'd like to share from my own career trajectory that, you know, I've never said no to any opportunities. So I'd say women, you know, persevere, hang in there. There's lots of challenges that you have to come across. You have to be very resilient uh, when, when you are facing these challenges. Um, and I think as women, you know, we've got a lot of other factors to play as well. You know, we're homemakers, we're mothers, we're daughters, we're wives. So we've got all of that to juggle around our career as well. So resilience really is the name of the game and perseverance. Very well said. I'd now like to go specifically into, you know, e-pharmacy. And before I think we delve into e-pharmacy on the global stage, um, I think the audience would probably be interested to know uh, what essentially is the process of buying medicines in Pakistan and that, how, how that compares to, say, the UK and the US or any other example you could give in another country. Yeah, well, obviously, I can. That, that, this is something that, you know, um, I, uh, I really want to be a part of with, with the change in Pakistan. I don't know if it will happen in, in my lifetime, but, you know, I think the wheels have started coming in motion. Here in the UK, obviously, everything is very uh, strongly regulated. We even are over the counter medicines. They can't be sold without a pharmacist's presence. Um, think the, um, our prescription only medicines can only be um, given out to patients if there's a valid legal uh, prescription. And then the pharmacist needs to counsel the patient on their medication to ensure that, you know, the compliance concordance is all there. Um, and Yes, it sounds very basic, but unfortunately, these practices aren't happening across the board in Pakistan. We are having people who can just go to a pharmacy, buy an antibiotic, no questions asked, no pharmacist present. Um, that's the worst case scenario. But then with the same token, there are some excellent um, uh, uh, examples within Pakistan where the right thing is happening, where there is regulation, where there is monitoring, where they are trying to bring in these global practices to ensure the safe use of medicines. You know, I'd like to sort of acknowledge here Ehad Pharmacy. And healthcare, they have they have a pharmacist on the premises all the time. They um, uh, they they only give out medicines when there's a valid prescription. The counselling is happening, um, and you know it really is uh, you know refreshing to see that change is happening in Pakistan slowly but surely. But you know the newer pharmacies that are coming on board now, they want to have these global practices in place because they understand how important it is for patients to have. Uh, you know, uh, safe use of medicines. Absolutely. Having come from an e-pharmacy background as well, I think that's something that has directly been needed in Pakistan uh, ever since I, the startup ecosystem took off. And um, talking more about e-pharmacies, I was actually uh, watching um, uh, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and he had Mark Cuban on. He, Mark Cuban actually just launched his own online pharmacy called Cost Plus Drugs. 
I believe is the, is the name of it. I'm just going to have a look. There's quite a few, actually. I, I, I was going to list them later. <laughs> All right. But uh, yeah, it's costplusdrugs.com. And I had a look at the website and, uh, you know, his USP is essentially eliminating the middleman. So I believe he's done uh, direct deals with the manufacturers themselves. Then he sells, you know, those uh, products, which appear to be specialty products in nature at a fraction of the retail price. And uh, it seems like he's got the quality assurance there. And it's, it's very funny, right, that, you know, we thought that Jeff Bezos, especially with his acquisition of drugs.com, would not invite any competition because that's essentially what, you know, pharmacy is. It's a very cutthroat field. And uh, Amazon is a giant in itself. But, you know, there, there is obviously still gaps in the market that need to be filled. And someone like Mark Cuban coming in is a huge testament to that. Um, you know, even in like... Uh, uh, in Indonesia, what I saw before my own e-pharmacy merged with another telehealth pharmacy, both were actually family-based, was something extremely similar happening in, in Indonesia where one brother who ran an e-pharmacy merged his company with another brother who ran a telehealth portal. And, uh, you know, even a large now uh, offers both e-pharmacy and teleconsultation service. So... Okay. I, you know, I think everyone would like to know, like, not just, you know, in, in Pakistan, but like, what other impressive e-pharmacy models have you seen all over the world? And what would you feel their USPs or what would their unique value propositions be to the customer? Well, well I think we would need to firstly appreciate, Bilal, that uh, the e-pharmacy market globally is huge. It's absolutely huge. It's 256 billion they're expected to actually uh, uh by, by 2030 that's the expectation for 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 the market so there's a huge sort of uh growth when it comes to e-pharmacy there's a huge potential as well and i think we're seeing that you know people are using the internet more people people are uh, e-commerce e has become a huge uh, phenomenon now everyone's buying everything online so why can't you buy your medicines online as well so you know this is this is uh, again uh, rapidly grown and we're seeing you know people are living longer right our geriatric population is also rising so um and i think again uh during COVID, people are now more aware of their health, want to be more healthy. So people are using e-pharmacy, not just for their medicines, but also on for their wellness. So th like, uh, I think the term in Pakistan is nutraceuticals, but we say over here, you know, your vitamins and what have you, your extra uh, supplementation, they're using e-pharmacy for all of that. So it's a, it's absolutely is a growing market and one that is uh, growing very, very rapidly. So when it comes to e-pharmacy, I think the model is is fairly simple. So when you say, you know, what is there a gold standard or is there a, a best model when it comes to buying your medicines online? Um, I think I think the sort of crux of it really is that there needs to be heavy regulation when it comes to e-pharmacy to ensure that you know people who are requiring requiring the medicine are requiring for the right reasons. They've got a valid doctor's prescription or a, a doctor's note or what have you when they are actually um, uh, uh, ordering their medicines online. So those heavy regulations really need to be put in place. And I think most of these models that, uh, that I've seen, they all have them, like your Amazon pharmacy has it, there's uh, 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 DRX, uh, Bioplus, Select RX. So Forbes Health, they've listed the you know the top twenty e pharmacy uh, uh, e pharmacies globally, um, and all of them have either an online doctor or they'll have a twenty four seven online pharmacist available as well. So I think when you, when you're saying you know what's the best sort of model, I think the best model is number one for it to be heavily regulated. Number two for there to be a healthcare professional there to validate um, the 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 not not claims but validate the the purchase. Um, and then, but also having that healthcare professional to actually counsel either either uh, whether it's in, within a chat box or whether it's on, uh, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, virtually, to actually counsel patients on their medication. Because 
I think that really is the missing piece in the puzzle when it comes to um, dispensing medication. Because once you've seen a doctor, the last person to actually see a patient before they go off to have them uh, start their therapy is the pharmacist. So the pharmacist is the last point of contact who is giving out the medicine to the patient to say, okay, this is how you take it. And, you know, you come and see me if you have any issues, because that then gives rise to other um, health complications if patients aren't taking their medication properly, say, for example, if they're having any side effects from it. So I think having th those sort of three pieces are, 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 are ingredients to any successful online e-pharmacy platform, in my opinion. It was very well said. I mean, I, I was actually reading, um, I was reading about, you know, Amazon's acquisition of drugs.com and then PillPack and then you know, drugs.com was simply an online pharmacy, so PillPack was specifically catered towards a recurring medicine user. And uh, when the project manager, you could say the pharma division, was asked, what are, you, what are you trying to achieve with this? Because your traditional brick and mortar pharmacies are technically valued at 20x more than what you guys are doing, and they're doing at least 20 or 30x more sales. And he had a very candid answer. He's like, I'm actually, so first of all, I'm trying to show that our model actually is more scalable than that because we spent, even if we're a 20th of their size, we probably spent a 50th of what they spent. So in that case, we're already technically more valuable pound for pound. And then when they asked, you know, what are you trying to prove? He said, one very viable future plan is to actually either create or acquire a telemedicine platform to get the online pharmacy and the pill pack platform going because um, it's, it's, it all comes down to like Occam's razor, right? The, the simplest explanation is often the correct one. And some people might ask, you know, if they have struggle, struggles with operating even a regular brick and mortar pharmacy, let alone an online one. The thing is, you know, you got to examine the patient. Now, even if you're a recurring diabetes user, you have to go see your doctor every month. And ultimately, right, you probably can quote me, um, like you can probably quote the figures on stats a lot of times the prescription ends up changing. It's not the exact same prescription that they'd have the month before. And, you know, so in, in order to create a successful e-pharmacy model, right, you're going to have to track that patient's history back to the doctor, his first interaction, say, with the GP, and then if he goes to a specialist, uh, that interactions, right? And then it all is basically chronologically and um, holistically linked at the same time. Absolutely. And, that's and I think... And I think some of these US models, they're actually linked to the health insurance companies of of patients. So so they can uh, share data. So then they, it automatically fills up the prescription. So Absolutely. I think, and some of these insurance companies actually do insurance and distribution as well. So they'll even do exactly. delivery of say where where but actually think, that has come, become really successful is not necessarily in the traditional pharmacy field, but in the specialty pharmacy field. Yeah. But I think but I think and I think to get to that level, I think we're we're quite some time away in Pakistan. Um, I think firstly we need to get everybody to adopt uh, using the internet for their healthcare needs, and I think that already is 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 a struggle in itself. I know, and I I absolutely know it's successful in some places, and I I feel from my experience, and please do correct me where I'm if if I'm wrong. This is just my observations that it's it's really your top two percent that are using. Um, you know, telehealth or who are using telepharmacy, your your sort of your middle class to your rural area people, they're not because A, they don't have access, but two, what I've seen in Pakistan and what I've heard and when I've spoken to people within from those tabkas is that they they want to see someone physically. And that mindset is still there. They want to have the touchy feely with the doctor. They want to go and get their medicines from the pharmacy or it's like well why should I pay to get my medicines delivered when I've got a driver sitting outside who can just go down to the local pharmacy and just pick up you know I'll give them the percha and they'll just go and get it for me so you know we, there's a lot of sort of th those kind of challenges as well in Pakistan that we have yeah I think you know especially when when you say about being in contact with the doctor I think technology can help with that but what I really think needs to happen in Pakistan is that doctors should go through some sort of sensitivity training because a lot of people have this fear of going to even a very well qualified doctor because they're not comfortable in opening up to him about their certain conditions or apprehensions and that's essentially why mental health over here has become you know such a big issue because that essentially is also a part of your consultation even if you have 
say, uh, high, high blood sugar, it could be caused by stress. A doctor has every right to know what the cause of that stress is because maybe he can give you some advice on that matter. And that would and, bring me, and, yeah. And what you've said, though, that's a very pertinent point because the thing is, you know, doctor-patient relationship, pharmacist-patient relationship is all based on trust. And if you don't have that trust, then you can't, you can't really support that patient's healthcare needs in in the right way, in the right possible way. So that again is is, is another issue that we that we are facing in Pakistan. Yeah. So along with this observation, a few others, you know, brings me back. No, oh, I've lost you there, Bilal. Bilal, I've lost you. Hello? No, That's better. Can you hear me? I can hear yeah. you. Can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So the two other observations I wanted to make don't necessarily have to do with e-pharmacy, they have to do with healthcare in general. So when small comes around, we see a lot of people, you know, take to the streets saying that, oh, you know, close down these brick kilns, start using more, you know, environmentally uh, conscious uh, petrol in your cars, get better quality coal, so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, all we needed to do to curtail that problem was to shut everything down for two weeks, which you only did when something like COVID came about. And then yep. you saw yep. that in, in March or April uh, of 2020, when your air quality index would normally be around 200 uh, nanograms per cubic meter, it went down to around 40. That's like the level of clean air you have in like the West Coast. So my last question is what can we do as global citizens to spread awareness of good healthcare practices so that, you know, um, people are more aware of the different technologies that are around in healthcare and they can make a more impact on, you know, people's lives. That's a really difficult question to, to answer, Bilal, because the thing is, I think right now everyone's got the internet on their fingertips and they're constantly seeing what's happening around the world. Um, and I think, there's a lot of frustration then that builds up then within Pakistan. Like you said, that, that was a simple solution, close everything down for two weeks and then we had better quality of air. But then my question to you is, I'll flip that around, by closing that down for two weeks, how much, uh, you know, how much loss did that, did the country incur because of that? So it's, it's finding that fine balance, really. We can put, you know, you can put these really drastic measures in place, but then with an emerging com economy like Pakistan, can we afford to do things like that? So then, you know, there are sort of more simpler things we can do. So I'll take Karachi uh, as an example, Karachi being my home city, and I love Karachi to death, as everybody knows. But, you know, pollution uh, is a huge issue in, in, in Karachi. You know, people are just throwing litter everywhere. That contributes a lot then to, to uh, you know, um, uh, infectious diseases. So if people did simple things, simple tasks like not throwing their rubbish out, out of the window, but actually throwing their rubbish where they should, you know, simple things like that people need to take ownership of. Um, and, you know, I think there's tried to be like national movements when it comes to litter um, and, uh, and, and the implications of litter. But I think, you know... I, I'm at a loss here. I think we need to be the change we want to see. I think if every if every individual took took ownership of trying to do their little bit for the country, um, we, we we'd see Pakistan in a much better place. That's just my opinion. <laughs> no, that was a very pertinent question. So actually, um, I think in the initial days of like the lockdown in March, Karachi stock Pakistan stock exchange was around 15 points daily and. The 2019 to 2020 economic growth was negative, you know, 0.7, and uh, don't really have the facts and figures about factories. But a lot of manufacturing jobs were lost. A lot of different sectors were hit quite heavily. Even in the first ever lockdown, pharmacies had a time limit. They had to shut down by nine. Uh, offices also uh, had to shut down by a certain time, so that affected a lot of BPOs that had call centers that had service foreign clients at night. 
so uh, there is that loss to the economy and quite frankly, right, sometimes there is, you know, that question of how much should one compromise and what balance should we keep? Because obviously it's not, uh, running a country isn't just about making sure our economy improves. Like that might be an easier solution, for, for example, to improve your economy than to say, improve your overall air quality, than to improve your wa the quality of your water, to improve your standard of living, to improve even uh, healthcare in your country. So there is a balance and sometimes, you know, uh, there, there can be solutions that, in which all of these uh, indicators can go up. Uh, Absolutely. But then and I again, think, right? And I think the, yeah. the healthcare system in Pakistan, and if we see population wise as well, you know, over 70% are in, in rural areas. So what are we doing to try and ensure that, you know, healthcare is reaching there? Yes, we've got BHUs located, but, you know, some villages that I've gone to, it's, it takes it takes villagers at least an hour to get to the BHU and the cost to get to the BHU. And when you get to that BHU, the doctor's not there. So, I, you know, I, 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 I suppose I don't have the solution to the problem right now, but the thing is, yes, I know we're identifying what the, the problems are. But I think, you know, if healthcare professionals, I don't know if there needs to be some kind of consortium or there needs to be some kind of think tank that, you know, maybe advises to the health ministries where you have, you know, global experts, healthcare professionals to actually um, to try and find solutions to these problems. We can try and bring telemedicine into rural areas. We absolutely can. But then, you know, there's connectivity issues. There's, uh, you know, you've got to train people on how to how to use, uh, you know, these telemedicine platforms, because the most they can do is use WhatsApp, you know, from where, where you know, villages that I've gone to. However, with the right training, they can absolutely use the telemedicine. So maybe you can bring telemedicine there. But then there's a huge cost you know, that that's associated to that going into the last while. People creating or bringing in devices uh, that, you know, like say, for example, portable MRIs are now available in Pakistan. The reason why you can't open an MRI center in a place like Australia is because electricity, they're stable. Same case in a place like Fata, for example. Like you're talking about somebody walking an hour uh, to go see a PHU. If someone breaks his leg in the car, he has to go to the shower and now that get an MRI. And yeah, it all has to do with, you know, awareness and someone 